Zephaniah, the book of Zephaniah tonight. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord which came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, who is the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. Zephaniah was the great, great grandson of one of the greatest kings that the southern kingdom of Judah ever had, a king by the name of Hezekiah. Uh, two great kings in that southern kingdom were Hezekiah and Josiah, both of whom are mentioned uh, in this verse 1. Most often when the prophets would write uh, as an introduction to their prophecies to give us uh, a sense to understand their context from the historical books of First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, typically they would give us the name of their father and of their grandfather because uh, a lot of names were common. Uh, Zephaniah is the only one who takes us back four generations. And uh, for some reason, by the Spirit of God, it's important to him that we know that he is of the lineage of Hezekiah. And so that those that are listening to him know that he has a royal lineage and that he has a godly lineage. I think it's a tremendous thing when a man, a great, great grandfather, has lived his life so well for the glory of God that a great, great grandson that he'll never see, never know, uh, never know is even going to exist would be so elated to be a part of that lineage that um, they'd let everyone know about it. And that's a good way to spend your life, to have that kind of, of a lineage and that kind of an impact. And Hezekiah spent his life that way. And Zephaniah was glad for it. Zephaniah prophesied to the southern kingdom of Judah and to its capital of Jerusalem, and his prophecies were given... Uh, in the city of Jerusalem, uh, he gives his prophecies, we're told in verse 1, at the time of Josiah, which was a tremendous time in the history of the southern kingdom of Judah. Under Josiah, he became a king, I think, at like eight years of age. And, of course, when you become a king at eight years of age, you, you know, your counselors become very important, and the godly men that are, surround you. But at the age of 16, something happened between him and the Lord. All of the lights went on, and he became very zealous for the Lord and concerned about the Lord at that as a young teenage king. And he began a destruction of all of the idols that filled the land because of his uh, father and his grandfather, both of whom were two of the most wicked kings that Judah ever had. And he began this wiping out of all of the idols and uh, then a few years later, the law of Moses was discovered while they were doing construction in the temple. It had been lost from the national life of Judah for years. And when he read that law of Moses, it was read to him. He began to double his efforts, realizing how far they had fallen from the Word of God. And the Word of God is the standard that causes any society to realize how far they've fallen. And so he realized we're in deep trouble and he sent his, his cabinet to go and find out from the Lord, how bad a trouble are we in? And they went to the prophetess Huldah, and Huldah said, you're in deep trouble. But you're okay because of the concern of your heart. And she began to speak encouraging things to him. He called the whole nation together to come and hear the word of God and to turn to the Lord. But it was just a surface revival. It would be kind of like if the President of the United States in the United States was got saved and then um, in order to do business or to have a place of some kind of power or whatever, you say, well, the President got saved and so we better become a little more righteous in what we're doing. So it just affected them outwardly, but it didn't change the heart of the people. And so it was just a surface revival. 
And Zephaniah is ministering sometime in that period, probably after the discovery of the Word of God and the revival. And he's coming in behind Josiah and he's speaking to the people and he's saying, God knows that something real happened in Josiah, but he also knows nothing happened in you or in very few of you. And so he begins to rebuke their heart because that's what the Lord always looks at. He looks at the heart and not how full the temple is or how people can say praise the Lord and those kinds of things. And so he comes in and Zephaniah ministers during this kind of circumstance there uh, in the history of the southern kingdom of Judah. The theme of the book is, has a single great theme, and that is the day of the Lord. That theme, that phrase is repeated uh, seven times in the book, and the day of the Lord uh, most often in the scriptures speaks of the coming judgment of the Lord. In the New Testament, both Peter and Paul, when they speak of the day of the Lord, they speak of the great tribulation period that's to come at the end of the age, uh, that uh, seven-year period that culminates in the battle of, of Armageddon. And so uh, he speaks of the judgment that's to come upon Judah because of their disobedience. One of the interesting things about Zephaniah is that his, you know, a lot of the, of the, the prophets, uh, even like Amos who came from the field and all, they're very poetic in their language and, and all, and uh, beautiful. Zephaniah is like James in the New Testament. He's just straight. I mean, he's just very, very clear. And uh, as you'll see in his introduction to his sermon, there was a day uh, where... Um, one time, I was sitting in my office, and, you know, you can only sit for so long. And I said, I, I need to take a walk. And so I took a walk through downtown area here. And, and I like urban areas. I like urban centers and the different architecture of it and all of that. And I was walking down one of these streets just a few blocks up, and there's this little tiny building. I mean, it's no bigger than, you know, here to that wall squared. And just a neat little thing that they kind of built there and attached to something and on. And uh, very much, you know, 40-ish in its, in its look. And so I went in to look inside the windows up against it. It was deserted. So, you know, somebody should do that with, like, mirror glass. And you look in there. Somebody looking right there at you. And um, But it, it was obviously deserted. And interesting, the whole place was like all of the furniture that was there when it was built. <laughs> it was very, very ancient. But there's a simple desk there, one chair to sit in, and then some... Field and Stream magazines from uh, 1936. And, uh, but there's this beautiful this plaque that was up behind the desk of whoever owned that office. And the, on it was uh, just six simple words. It said, be brief, be blunt, be gone. <laughs> and I think that's very sagacious advice for any preacher. I swear, I'm working on it. But uh, Zephaniah, Zephaniah, took it to heart. He's very brief. He's very blunt. And uh, he says it in, in things in a very unmistakable way. So he begins in verse two, his prophecy speaking for the Lord. The Lord declares to Jerusalem and Judah, I will utterly consume everything. The Lord is going to utterly consume everything off of the face of the land, says the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, and the stumbling blocks, that is, the idols of the world, along with the wicked. I will cut off man from the face of the land, says the Lord. It's quite an introduction to a sermon, isn't it? But that's the way that he was. And God declares that he is going to destroy everything utterly off of the face of the land. Now, interesting thing. Zephaniah follows a pattern of the Old Testament prophets, and that is very often when God was prophesying through a prophet, there was a near fulfillment and there was a far fulfillment. In other words, God would be speaking to Judah or speaking to Israel, but he would be speaking them to them in such a way that you'd look at the prophecy and say, well, I see how that could be fulfilled, but there's no way that the entirety of that can be fulfilled in, in Judah or in Israel, so it must have a larger context. And so very often when God speaks of judgment, he's speaking to a present 
near situation of the prophet, but he's also speaking of the judgment that's going to come at the end of the age. One of the fascinating things about Zephaniah's prophecy is that he never identifies the vessel that God is going to use to bring judgment on Judah, and that is the Babylonians. He never mentions them by name in the entirety of the book. Now, we know that he prophesied at the time of Nahum, and he prophesied at the time of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah spoke clearly of who God was going to use to judge the southern kingdom of Judah, and that was the Babylonians. Why would Zephaniah not mention them? Why would God not mention it through him? And I think the reason is, is because Jeremiah was already making that clear, or he would soon make that clear to them. But God is also using Zephaniah and saying, listen, this has a near application with the Babylonians, but I want you to keep your thinking open and recognize that its fullest fulfillment is going to happen at the end of the age, which we'll see a little more fully as, as we head into chapter 3. Then the Lord speaks in verse 4 and said, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now, he's not talking about pagans here. He's talking about God's people who are living like pagans. He's going to have to judge them because of their sin. And one of the great sins of Judah at this time was their idolatry. They were worshiping everything that the world was worshiping. There was no distinction between the Jew and all of the neighboring nations. And, uh, and so, uh, without this uh, distinctiveness, the judgment was going to come even upon God's people. And so he said, I'm going to stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off every trace of Baal from this place. He said, I am going to cut off Baal, the prophet of Baal, from the land. The false prophet, another prophet, the false idol, the false god of Baal, was the ancient Canaanite god of, uh, of agriculture. And the, so what the Jews began to do is they began to say, well, you know, we pray to the Lord as it relates to our crops, so we'll have a good crop. But, you know, the Canaanites, they kind of pray over here to Baal. And, you know, you really you can't have too many gods in your corner. And so they began to incorporate all of these things together. And, but the problem is, is that God's a jealous God. He's not willing to share us. And I mean, imagine the height of pride to think that God ought to share me with, you know, with, with someone else. Who do I think I am? And so uh, God isn't going to do it. And the worship of, of this idol uh, of Baal was uh, they'd have their shrines. They would offer sacrifices, uh, all kinds of sensual activity and prostitution associated with it. And this is what God's people were involved in. And God said, I'm going to come in and I'm going to wipe Baal out completely out of the land. And then he said, in terms of cutting off next, he said, I'm going to cut off the names of the idolatrous priests with the pagan priests, these priests that were leading people into the worship of idolatry instead of in the worship of the true and the living God. He would cut off those who worship the host of heaven on the housetops. And so here are God's people engaged in astrology, the worship of the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. God said, I'm going to bring an end to all of it. And those who worship and swear oaths by the Lord, but who also swear by Milcom. So again, there's this idea among God's people here in that time where out of one side of their mouth, they're praising the Lord. Oh, I trust the Lord. Oh, I believe the Lord in all of this. And then on the other side of their mouth, they were also worshiping and, and paying service to Milcom. Now, Milcom is a, is a name for, for uh, the ancient, uh, also known in the Old Testament, but the ancient name of Molech. And that was simply the god of sex. It was the god of, of uh, lust. And uh, so here you had God's people saying one thing related to the Lord, and then over here in their private lives and in their home and all away from the temple and all, they had this whole thing going on in the worship of Molech, which I don't need to tell you uh, was extremely sensual uh, in its uh, practices there in those days. And the Lord said, I will also cut off those, verse 6, who have turned back from following the Lord and have not sought the Lord nor inquired of him. He was going to cut off 
the backslider, those that had turned from him. And so uh, important for us to realize tonight as we let the passage search us, if you're here tonight and you're backslidden, um, how dare us call ourselves a Christian and offer the Lord our back? That's an affront. The priest would never have gotten away with that under that old covenant. They would have been killed before they got out of the temple by God himself. No one was to ever offer the Lord their back. When the priest would go into the Holy of Holies and do what they would do, they would then back out. They would, no one would even dream of ever falling into a place where they would ever expect God to accept their back. And so if you're here tonight and you're backslidden, or maybe know all of the different words and everything, but the Bible talks about the backslider in heart. Don't presume upon his grace. It, tonight's the night to turn back to him with a whole heart. And so as God denounces these things, these things that he was going to cut off from them, why? Because he had spoken to them and spoken to them and spoken to them to remove these things from their lives. They didn't do it. God said, all right, I'll do it, but it's going to be very, very hard. Remember, Jeremiah spoke to these people for 40 long years, the same message. It wasn't like this was a surprise by the time that it came. They'd been warned. And so maybe tonight, as it relates to the worship of Baal, my mind is divided into the worship of whatever it might be or the worship of Molech, or, or uh, the backslidden state, or whatever it might be. Maybe some things need to go out of our house, out of our hearts, out of our lives tonight, instead of just looking at it and saying, yes, those are, it's good to know what the content of those three verses are. They're intended to search us and to speak to us uh, tonight, so that we are walking in a way that, the, that, the, that honors the Lord in a way that He deserves. Then the Lord said, be silent in the presence of the Lord God for the day of the Lord. And here we have its first occurrence is at hand. And here is he uh, it begins to speak of the day of the Lord. He begins to liken Judah uh, to a sacrifice that he is going to offer to the Babylonians. In other words, um, it's kind of like God speaking and saying, listen, I'm inviting the Babylonians to a barbecue. What are they eating? Judah. You. And, uh, and so uh, this is the imagery that he's, he's using. For the day of the Lord is at hand, for the Lord has prepared. He's prepared what, this judgment for Judah. He has prepared a sacrifice, speaking of Jerusalem and Judah, and he has invited his guests, the Babylonians, and it shall be in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes of the king's children and all such as are clothed with foreign apparel. And so he speaks of his judgment that he's going to bring on the princes, and he identifies them as those who are clothed with foreign apparel. In other words, they're following the foreign customs of the nations around them. God had raised the Jews up to be an influence upon the foreign nations and an influence for good. Instead, they had been influenced. And God speaks of the fact that his judgment would come upon the princes because of this. And in the same day, I will punish those who leap over the threshold, who fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. Those who are robbing their fellow citizens, oppressing them. God said, I've taken note of it, and I'm going to bring judgment upon you also. And there shall be in that day, says the Lord, the sound of a mournful cry from the fish gate, a wailing from the second quarter, and a loud crashing from the hills. Wail, you inhabitants of Maktesh, for all the merchant people are cut down. All those who handle money are cut off. And so the Lord declares his judgment that's going to come, that he's going to offer the merchants up to, to the Babylonians as a sacrifice, and that the inhabitants of Maktesh there in verse 11 uh, would, uh, it, it would wail, they would lament. It's interesting, Maktesh was the um, ancient bazaar area 
of the city of Jerusalem. You go to Jerusalem today and you have the Arab section, the Jewish section, and all these little streets, narrow streets you go through. Everybody's selling everything in the world and nothing in the world. You know, you've never seen so much olive wood in your life. But you're going through and all these different things and need experience and all. And, uh, and so just kind of the bazaar, God said, this bazaar is going to wail. The Babylonians are going to come in and, and they're going to spoil it. They're going to take it from them. One of the fascinating things about this prophecy of Zephaniah, there in verse 10, is that the Lord declares the sound of a mournful cry from the fish gate. And in the city of Jerusalem, there were gates that led into the city. Here he speaks about this mournful cry from the fish gate. And one of the fascinating things is that when Nebuchadnezzar made his way into Jerusalem, the point that he broke into the city through was the fish gate. Uh, just as Zephaniah had prophesied. Isn't the word of God uh, amazing? And then he moves on in verse 12 and said, It shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps. Uh, and so you can kind of picture the Babylonians now coming into the city. They've got their torches and their lamps, and they're making their way you know, through, uh, through the city to the riches. And he said, And I will and to, and punish the men who are settled in complacency or settled in their lees, who say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. And so the Lord speaks about the fact that he's going to bring his judgment upon the lukewarm, upon the indifferent. To be settled upon your lees was a winemaking term in that day when they would take and uh, uh, the grape juice from the wines, they would put them in these vessels. They would let the vessels then sit in place, let the sediment fall to the bottom, and then they would pour the wine, the upper f part of the fluid, into another vessel, removing the lees or the sediment, and, and they'd pour it into the next vessel, and then they'd let that filter down, and they poured, and progressively, through that being poured from vessel to vessel, you would end up with a very pure and very good um, bottle of wine. If you did not move uh, a wine and move it from vessel to vessel, it would get what was called settled on its lees. In other words, the sediment that went to the bottom would then spoil the wine. And that's what had happened to them. They had become rich. Uh, their wealth they had used to keep them from allowing the Lord to move them through trials and through difficulty and through these different things from bottle to bottle to bottle. And instead, they got settled in their lees. Their lives became rotten and spoiled and good for nothing in terms of influencing the surrounding nations. And so God said he would come in and he would judge them. This, these men who are in the words of the New King James, settled in their complacency. He describes them as those who say in their heart, and the heart is what the Lord looks at, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. It's the kind of person that acknowledges the existence of God, but doesn't believe practically that he's going to do anything. Not now, not ever. And that kind of a person, a person that says, you know, yeah, I believe in the existence of God, and they, and they give, you know, God all of the words and all of that kind of stuff. But inside their heart, they look and they say, it doesn't matter one bit whether I obey him or not, or, or I acknowledge him or not, or anything like that. And, uh, and that kind of person ends up being settled in their lease. And they find out one day, in a, in a very difficult way, that God does exist. He said, therefore, their goods shall become booty. They had uh, gotten this, all of their wealth by their idolatry and their disobedience. God said, it's going to become booty to the Babylonians. And their house is a desolation. And they shall build houses, but not inhabited. They shall plant vineyards, but not drink their wine. The great day of the Lord, there's the phrase again, is near. It is near and hastens quickly. And here you have... One of the most beautiful passages in the Old Testament uh, that describes the day of the Lord. He describes it as, first of all, being near. And, of course, that's the attitude that we're to have today, that the day of the Lord is near. The rapture of the church is near, which then allows the great tribulation to proceed. And so we live with that in our heart, that the day of the Lord is near, the rapture of the church is near, and it keeps our lives pure. 
So the day of the Lord is near, and it hastens quickly. It's coming quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There the mighty men, Judah's mighty men, shall cry out, The day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and against the high towers. And so it's the day of the Lord is going to be a terrible, terrible time. And I'm very thankful that I'm not going to be here for it. And verse 17, I will bring distress upon men and they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. Why has that judgment come uh, upon them? Because of their sin against the Lord, their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like refuse. In other words, there would be so few people left in Jerusalem at the conquering of the Babylonians. There would not be enough able-bodied people to bury the bodies that had been slain. And neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he will make speedy riddance uh, of all those who dwell in the land. In other words, the day of the Lord, the judgment of God, would be inescapable for those that found themselves in the middle of it because of their rebellion. The Lord speaks of his jealousy here, and they had forsaken him for these dumb, stupid, non-speaking, non-hearing, non-walking, non-anything idols. And uh, here they are, the... Uh, the, the wife of the Lord, the wife of Jehovah, Israel was in the Old Testament. And here his wife has left him for a bunch of stones and wood. And the Lord said, I'm a bit jealous over that, uh, but I know how to take care of it. And then chapter 2, he calls him to repentance. And he said, gather yourself together. Yes, gather together, O undesirable nation. He calls... Uh, Jerusalem and Judah, an undesirable nation, literally a shameless nation, a shameless nation. They had reached a point where no one was ashamed of anything in the culture. And that's always a sign that a culture is in deep trouble and indeed can be on its last days. What in this nation that we live in, is anyone ashamed of anymore? I, uh, speaking of sin, is there any sin that has any stigma attached to it anymore? Uh, or has an excuse been provided for everything? Well, it's a, it's a dangerous place to be. And it was, and so here is, here they are, absolutely shameless. No one was ashamed of, of anything. They probably all laughed and then went on all of those stupid afternoon shows and uh, talked about how weird they were and beat each other up and the host and uh, got their free trip to New York and uh, nobody told them that they ought to be ashamed of what they, they just did. But listen, we don't want to go there, do we? Verse 2. He said, before the decree is issued, and notice that word before, or the day passes like chaff, before, and there's the word again, the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you, what should we do before that happens? Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice, and again a second time, seek righteousness, seek humility, that it may be uh, that you, uh, that it may, <laughs> it may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. And so he encourages them before the judgment comes, seek me. Get turned around because by the time the judgment does come, it's going to be uh, too late. The opportunity to repent and to turn back to God is a privilege. There comes a time when the before is gone and it's too late. And now I'm in the thick of judgment. If we're in that place, any of us tonight, 
then God says, before that happens, then seek Him. Turn back to Him tonight. Before we partake of communion, the symbols of Jesus' body and of His blood that is the only reason that we have the privilege of repentance. Before we partake of that tonight, the privilege of being able to turn back to Him if, if I need to do so. And so He warns them that the only place of safety was in turning back to Him, the safety of holiness. And then God begins to speak about His judgment, having spoken about it, that it was to come upon Judah and Jerusalem. He declares that His judgment is also going to come upon the surrounding nations. And He's going to address the nations to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south of Judah. One of the things that's interesting to me here in, in all of this that, that he does is he moves on to speak of the judgment uh, of these, these uh, uh, Gentile nations around Judah is that sometimes uh, when the world will look at Christians, um, somehow oftentimes a person will think that uh, sin in our lives is different than sin in their lives. But the Bible teaches sin is sin. God doesn't like it in His people, but He doesn't like it in the world either. And sometimes the world will look at a Christian who fails or a Christian who sins or a Christian who falls or whatever, and uh, they'll just be so indignant as it relates to that. And that's something that we have to bear when that, when that kind of a thing happens. But oftentimes in the mind of someone in that condition is that if I do the same thing that they did, it doesn't matter because I don't believe in God. It doesn't matter if I don't believe in God. He believes in Him. He's there. And He doesn't like sin in anyone. So a person says, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God or whatever it might be. It doesn't matter. Judgment's coming. Uh, you know, I don't believe in God. Too bad, you're wrong. This is Zephaniah. This is the way he speaks. Who died and made you whoever? You know, who cares what you think? No one cares what you think. Or what I think, apart from the Lord. We're going to die and nobody's going to remember a single thing we said. You know, so anyway, so here they are. You know, there's that that attitude. And uh, but sin is sin in everyone's life. And all of it will be judged if God is forced to bring his judgment against it for Gaza. Speaking of the nations to the west of Judah, uh, the uh, Philistines, he lists the main cities of the Philistines for Gaza shall be forsaken and Ashkelon desolate. They shall drive out Ashdod at noonday, and Ekron shall be uprooted. And the Babylonians did all of this. Woe to the inhabitants of the sea coast, the nation of the Cherethites, which means the, the Philistines. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines. I will destroy you, so there shall be no inhabitant. The sea coast shall be pastures with shelters for shepherds and folds for flocks. The coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed their flocks there. And the houses of Ashkelon, they shall lie down at evening. For the Lord their God will intervene for them and return their captives. And so their cities would be wiped out, and they were. And their land would then be taken over by Jewish shepherds, and that happened. There was a poor remnant that was left in the land by the Babylonians when they finally conquered Jerusalem for the third time. And, uh, and essentially these uh, poor Jewish shepherds and vine dressers and all, they had all the land to themselves. I mean, everyone had been taken captive and, and taken away. And so they ventured off into the area of the coastland, took their flocks there, and the area of the Philistines became theirs. Then he addresses the nations to the east. He said, for I have heard the reproach of Moab, Jordan, and the insults of the people of Ammon, with which they have reproached my people and made arrogant threats against their borders. And therefore, as I live, says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be like Sodom and the people of Ammon like Gomorrah, overrun with weeds and salt pits and a perpetual desolation. The residue of my people shall plunder them and the remnant of my people shall possess them. And again, that same remnant that was left behind following the defeat of, of Jerusalem uh, ventured into the lands of Moab and Ammon and had them basically to themselves. For this shall be, uh, this they shall have 
for their pride because they have reproached and made arrogant threats against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be awesome to them, for he will reduce to nothing all of the gods of the earth. People shall worship him and him only, each one from his place, and the, all of the shores of the nations. And so the Lord was going to bring his judgment upon Moab and Ammon because of their speaking against their making of threats and reproaching of the children of Israel. Uh, God noted what um, these nations had to say about his people. And uh, God kind of has the attitude uh, concerning uh, the world as it relates to his people. And that is, listen, I'm free to rebuke them and I'm free to correct them, uh, but you don't get to spank them. That's what a father gets to do. And so when these nations began to enter into a place that God reserved to himself, the disciplining of his people, he got upset about it and he judged them in turn for it. You Ethiopians, now addressing the nation to the south, also you shall be slain by my sword. And then in verse 13, he moves to the nations of the north, uh, Assyria and its capital Nineveh, and he will stretch out his hand against the north destroy Assyria and make Nineveh a desolation as dry as the wilderness. The herds shall lie down in her midst, every beast of the nation, both the pelican and the bittern, shall lodge in the capitals of her pillars. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be at the threshold, for he shall he will lay bare the cedar work this is the rejoicing city, speaking of Nineveh, the, uh, ancient, the capital of the ancient empire of Assyria. This is the rejoicing city that dwelt securely, that said in her heart, I am it and there is none beside me. <laughs> Don't ever say that. that's a bad thing. Is it? <laughs> and what has happened to her? How she has become a desolation, humbled, a place for beasts to lie down. Everyone who passes by her shall hiss and shake his fist. Astonishing prophecy. We've seen it in a couple of other places. But at the time that Zephaniah prophesies, Nineveh still exists. A city that we know from Jonah and his ministry to it, that it took an able-bodied, healthy man three days to walk the exterior wall of the city all the way around, the size of the city, it was a city with three walls, a city that had so much pasture land within the walls, water supply, all of these things. It was designed to withstand a 25-year siege by any enemy. It was unthinkable in Zephaniah's day that Nineveh could ever fall. And when he makes this prophecy, people had to think, this guy is crazy. He's mad. But he wasn't the one that was mad. The person that's mad is the person that bets against this word, any portion of this word. And the interesting thing that we're told by historians is that by the time Alexander the Great came into power, and made his way in his conquering of the world into that area of the Middle East and on into Asia, that he and his troops walked over and by the ancient city of Nineveh and didn't even know it existed. That's how thoroughly it had been wiped out. It had only been discovered by archaeologists in the last 150 years. And nobody, he, they read the Bible account and didn't think the thing existed until it was uncovered. And so here is Zephaniah speaking of the fact that this is going to come to pass. Do you see how crazy it is to bet my life and to bet my eternity against what God says is true about this life and true about eternity in His Word? It's insanity. The old saying is that the dice of the gods are loaded. Believe me, they're more than loaded when it comes to our God. He's revealed to us the future in advance. No one in their right mind bets against this book that knows anything about this book. 
And I beg you, please, tonight, that if you're in that place that you've never given your life to the Lord, that you need to do it tonight. Don't bet that he's wrong. He cannot be wrong because he cannot lie. And so here is this fabulous prophecy, so unthinkable in, in Zephaniah's day, but it came to pass. People speaking of the Lord's return, speaking of the great tribulation that's going to come upon the earth. All of the things that the Bible says about the last days. And so many people look at it and they say, that's unthinkable. That could never happen. It's going to happen. It's going to be happen. We're not the first generation to face incredible circumstances and monuments built by man that stand there against the small promise of God over here and to think there is no way that that promise is going to ever outlive what we've built here. But it has it every single time it has. And what it has been, it's, it's going to be, don't bet against the Word of God. Don't bet against your need to be saved tonight and your need to surrender to the Lord and receive His forgiveness and His salvation and to come to know Him tonight. In chapter 3, Zephaniah continues, and he said, Woe to her, as Israel is now likened to a woman. Woe to her who is rebellious, as he begins to detail her sins, and polluted to the oppressing city. She has not obeyed his voice. She has not received correction. She has not trusted in the Lord. She has not drawn near to her God. That's quite a list of sins, and she was guilty of all of them. Her princes, now speaking of her rulers that he was going to judge, her princes are in her midst, uh, uh, in her midst are roaring lions. Uh, he's going to talk about the princes and the judges and the prophets and the priests and everything that he has to say about every one of them. They have a, a common denominator, and the common denominator is every single one of them used this incredible position that God gave them to influence a nation for righteousness, and instead of doing it, they used their office as simply a way to make money. And that's a waste of a life, and that's a waste of a calling if that's all that my life is about. And so here are the princes in, the, in her midst. They're like roaring lions. In other words, devouring. They devoured the wealth of the people that they were ruling uh, for themselves. Her judges, instead of being concerned about righteous judgment, are evening wolves that leave not a bone till morning. In other words, they ate up everything that came their way too. Her prophets are insolent and treacherous people, and the uh, New Living Translation puts it this way, they're arrogant liars seeking their own gain, and that captures it pretty well, the condition of the prophets in those days. All that mattered was that we get a a good check out of it. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to her law. So the priests, instead of being faithful to declare the word of God to people, They were making the word say what it didn't say and having it not say what it did say and all of this uh, to to the people. They weren't faithful in teaching. And it's interesting. We read about the priests there uh, have polluted the sanctuary. Well, the sanctuary uh, was polluted with idolatry that had been brought in, the idolatry that was in their hearts when they came into, into the sanctuary. But when the Bible talks about something being profane in the Old Testament, sometimes we think, oh, profane, you know, as it, as it must just have been terrible. But in, in the Hebrew of the Old Testament, the word profane means uh, to, to be common, to be outside the line of the holy. It means to be just like everything else in the world. And the priest made the temple just like everything else in the world. Everything, everyone was going there worshiping everything that everyone else in the world was worshiping. They profaned it. Uh, they moved it from the high and the holy place that it ought to have been. The Lord is righteous in her midst, and the Lord speaks of his presence in her midst. And here he has to speak of it in the sense of judgment. He'll speak of it later in the terms of salvation. But notice that phrase, in her midst. Uh, the knowledge that the Lord is in our midst, that he's present with me all of the time. Uh, you tell a person, 
The Lord is here. He's with us. The Lord is present with us all of the time. For one kind of person, that's exciting. Oh, yes, thank you for reminding me. All right, Lord. For another kind of person, then that's not exciting news if they're not walking with the Lord. And so the presence of the Lord, the fact that he's in our midst, is exciting or not so exciting, depending on the condition of, of, of the hearer or, or, or the person that's, that's in that place where the Lord is, is present. And so here it was bad news because he had to be there to judge. And he will do no unrighteousness. His judgment will be just. Every morning he brings his justice to light. He never fails, but the unjust knows no shame. And once again, he brings up the shamelessness of God's people. I have cut off nations. Their fortresses are devastated. I will make their streets desolate with none passing by. Their cities are destroyed. There is no one, no inhabitant. I said, surely you will fear me. You will receive instruction so that her dwelling would not be cut off despite everything for which I punished her. But they rose early and corrupted all of their deeds. The Lord was saying here that I judge the nations around Judah and Israel so that when they saw my judgment, that surely they would take and learn the lesson that this obviously displeases God, what they're worshiping, the sin that they're involved in. And then the only logical conclusion as it relates to that judgment is that I ought not to worship the same things. I ought not to bring those things into my home. I ought not to bring those things into my heart. But instead of looking at things and coming to the logical conclusions that anyone looking at it would come to, they took and they brought all of those things into their life, now forcing. I mean, look at all of these sins. What was the cause of all of it? And it's interesting that all of those sins that he lists all the way through this book, they're just symptoms. They're just symptoms of the real problem in the heart of God's people in that day, and he identifies it in that first phrase in verse 7, and that is, they did not have the fear of the Lord. They didn't fear the Lord. You can go into all kinds of an analysis of why is this person involved in uh, the worship of Baal or Molech or all of these things. You can analyze sin to the nth degree and people give their lives to doing that. But why is a person involved in those things that's indwelt by the Spirit of God? One thing for sure has happened, and that is there is no fear of him. I have no fear that he's going to destroy me. I love him. I'm confident in his grace. I know he's for me. I love his grace, all of those things. But I have a fear of him that is not, is, does not contradict his grace. They don't violate one another. A, a grace that uh, does not require a fear of the Lord. We've messed the grace up. But there is a respect for him where I never want to put him in a place where I force him to choose between being faithful to his word and my life. Because I know that heaven and earth is going to pass away and his earth isn't going to pass away. His word isn't going to pass away. And I know that he exalts his word even above his name. I know that if I put him in a place where he is forced to choose that, that he will be forced to choose his word. And so the importance of the fear of the Lord, an incredible honor and respect for who he is and what he ought to have and deserves from our lives because of who he is. And the Spirit of God is faithful to work these things in our lives, but they had long ago quenched and, and grieved the Holy Spirit. But the importance of the fear of the Lord. Not afraid that, you know, I've, you know, uh, sinned or I failed in, you know, here and there and God's going to kill me or something like that. We're not talking about that kind of a thing, but that, just that respect for the Lord. 
And then he said in verse 8, and now in verse 8, he heads into, uh, out into the future. It has its, its fullest fulfillment uh, in the thousand-year reign of Christ known as the millennium. But the Lord speaks in a, in a kind of a near fulfillment, in a partial fulfillment of the day when, when Israel would return from their Babylonian captivity. But its highest fulfillment is, is the day when the Lord establishes his kingdom on the earth. And he said, therefore, wait for me speaking to the to the faithful. I mean, they're in a, they're in a real tough spot because the righteous are, are hearing about this judgment that's coming too. And, uh, you know, sometimes we can find ourselves as Christians in this day. We read, you know, Matthew chapter 24, and we read uh, in First Thessalonians about the times that are going to come upon the world, you know, and all of a sudden we realize, hey, that we're not going to have a portion in the Great Tribulation, but these, these, some of these birth pangs are are going to be something that we're in the middle of. What does the Lord say to us? He says, wait for me. Just be watching and waiting for me. Just keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on me. Until the day I rise up for plunder, my determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms, to pour on them my indignation, all my fierce anger, all the earth shall be devoured, with the fire of my jealousy. And it seems to be speaking of Armageddon, where in his determination, he, there's the gathering of the nations, and he wipes them out in the valley of Megiddo. For then I will restore to the peoples at that time a pure language that they, may, uh, that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. The day coming, it could speak about the fact that in the millennium we'll all speak one language, but it could refer to the fact that no anything having to do with idols will be in anyone's vocabulary. It'll be a pure language. All that's spoken. Can you imagine a thousand years? The only thing that's spoken or printed or anything is that which honors and glorifies the Lord. Ooh, that'd be nice. And I'm going to be there, and so are you if you know the Lord. Verse 10, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, the daughter of my despised ones, shall bring my offering. And in that day you shall not be shamed for any of your deeds in which you transgress against me. For then I will take away, I will take away from your midst those who rejoice in your pride and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. Jesus said the meek shall inherit the earth. Zephaniah says the same thing. They're going to. The remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths, for they shall feed their flocks and lie down and no one shall make them afraid. And then continuing that theme of the future kingdom of God, the Lord declares, Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all of your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. In other words, it's going to be a time of joy, and it's going to be a time of praise. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. And now here is that in your midst again. But now it's a joy because they're in a condition that allows it to be joyful for them and also for the Lord. And you shall see disaster no more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Let not your hands be weak. The Lord your God uh, in your midst, again that phrase, uh, in their midst now, not to judge, but to save. The Lord your God, in your midst, the mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. In other words, the Lord's going to be as excited about the kingdom age as we are. <laughs> and he will quiet you with his love. It's a beautiful phrase, isn't it? Uh, there's some things that only love is able to quiet, and he will rejoice over you with singing. I will gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly, who are among you, 
to whom its reproach is a burden, behold, at that time I will deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame and gather those who are driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame in every land where they are put to shame. And so here the Lord begins to speak there in verse 18 to the righteous, and there were righteous Jews, uh, we know that, uh, you know, uh, Daniel was in there, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, these guys were in there. There were righteous Jews at the time that Babylon uh, conquered uh, the uh, uh, city of Jerusalem. And here uh, Zephaniah is speaking to them. You sorrow over the condition, what the land has become, what the worship of the Lord has become. And now he encourages them in what the Lord is is going to do. In other words, God's going to be faithful to his promises. This judgment isn't going to be the final word in the life of of the of the just and so that phrase is repeated over and over again and these final three verses the phrase is i will verse 18 you see that i will gather those and verse 19 behold at that time i will deal with all who afflict you i will save the lame and gather out those who are driven out i will appoint them for praise and fame in every land there where they were put to shame. You ever find yourself in a trial where it's so deep? One of the things that I pray for continually for people in difficulty and trial is I say, Lord, would you bring to their remembrance something from your word that they need to remember right now, that they need to hear from you? And the Lord knew that this righteous remnant needed to hear something from him to kindle that hope and to spark that hope within them. And so the Lord comes in with his I will, I will, I will, I will. Verse 20, at that time, I will bring you back, even at the time I gather you, for uh, I will give you fame or a name and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. The theme of the book of Zephaniah is the day of the Lord. And what a beautiful, beautiful truth that's spoken of over and over again in the New Testament of the fact that as his people who are in Christ Jesus, I'm not appointed to wrath. I never face his wrath. I never face his anger. I'll never, ever face his judgment, not one bit of it. Why? Because he carried it. Because he paid the price for me to escape it. A beautiful thing, when you look at the starkness with which Zephaniah speaks so clearly, so openly, so bluntly, of the judgment It was going to come in that day, but is yet to come upon this earth. The wrath of God in this world is due his wrath. But God has made a way, a provision for people to escape that wrath. And the provision is to be found in Christ Jesus. Beautiful reminder in the book of Zephaniah, and it's a continual theme throughout the minor prophets, and that is that the Lord wins, that the Lord wins. And those symbols of Jesus' body and of his blood is a testimony of the fact that the Lord has won and he wins in the end. He's going to manifest the fullness of his victory one day. The judgment and the sin of this world and all is not going to have the last say. The Lord is going to have the last say on planet Earth. And so, beautiful, beautiful book. The name Zephaniah is interesting as it relates to all of this. His name means Jehovah hides. And it has, carries with it the idea of Jehovah protects, Jehovah treasures. And interesting that in this 
the theme of what his name is as he delivers the message. And that is the place to hide from the judgment of God is in the salvation that he's provided. But the beauty of beauties is that Jesus Christ not only saves me from the judgment that I'm due, but that when I give my life to the Lord, I find that he offers me not only protection from that judgment, but he also treats me as a treasure. He hides me as a treasure. He makes us into a treasure by his Holy Spirit. We're so rich in Christ Jesus tonight.